Well, welcome everybody to another session in our Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas and I'm your host today. And today we are in the ladies room, you know, that place where women talk about things that we might not say just anywhere, things that we can only say to one another because, well, because we've had shared experiences, right? And this is our opportunity to talk about it, maybe vent some frustrations, give advice to each other, and come away with some new ideas or validation. We like to say that in the ladies room, we go there. Now our session today lasts for about an hour. If you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our panelists and attendees alike. Questions and comments are always welcome. And this is a free flowing conversation. So if you have something you wanna say, just say it. But if there's something that you wanna say anonymously, then you can just put it in the chat box to me and I will share it for you. So our topic today in the ladies room is hashtag me too. We all know what that means, but the question today is, is it generational? And this kind of came about as a result of a conversation that some of us were having. Uh, in fact, Susie and I were, were talking about, I, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't resonate with her. It doesn't resonate with this person. It totally resonates with this one. So we, I said, you know, we should do an in the ladies room about that. And so that's how this whole idea came about to do this particular topic. And there's, there's a lot of information out there on online about, how people feel about this and what their thoughts are. And of course, we've seen some, you know, pretty big men and big names taken down in the name of, of hashtag me too. So we're, we're just going to talk about it today. And I want to introduce my special guests um, today. And first of all, I have Susie Clisson. And Susie is um, the vice president, uh, director of I'm going to get this all wrong, Susie. I always do. I don't know what any of us do at CWI. You are the official run around and greet everybody at all the meetings and connect everybody together. That's what you are. So whatever title that is, is, is really good. Um, but her role is to connect women business owners, leaders, and CEO executives and build a strong professional community that fosters growth, support, and collaboration through the development of high-performing professional relationships. She's, uh, she's just a rock star in the CWI community. Next, we have Monique Guzman. And uh, Monique, I pulled this off of LinkedIn, and I just loved it. So I'm going to read it just like it is. It says, Chilean Mexican designer Monique Guzman combines her Latin flair and West Coast, West Coast vibe in her label, Siren Skirts. Based in San Diego, she embraces the female form and gives it a voice of power and beauty. Her designs are versatile and perfect for travel. They can go anywhere. Established in 2008, her label is a zero waste brand, one of a kind, and each is named like a painting, thus becoming art. And then we have Kristen Ariano, and Kristen also works with CWI. <laughs> And she is our project manager, radio producer, database and website wizard, um, video producer, uh, updating data records like crazy person uh, for Connected Women of Influence. And in her spare time, she's an, an esthetician at Bella Deora Spa. And she's got a couple of little rug rats running around. So she is very busy and multifaceted. And then finally, Susie, I'm gonna ask you to introduce us all to your daughter, Michaela. If you can, Susie. <laughs> it looks like she might be muted. Susie, can you hear me? All right, Michaela, introduce yourself. <laughs> um, I'm Michaela, Susie's daughter. Um, I work as a video game artist. And nice. um, yeah, I've been doing that for like 11 years now. Um, not 
not much else to add to that. I have two cats. <laughs> <laughs> what does a video game artist do? Um, it really depends on like where you work and what your specialty is, if anything. Um, I work at an indie studio, so it's really small and I specialize in 2D art. So anything from like a button that you might press in a video game to a character, to a monster, I take it from a concept, an idea, to a sketch. I make final art and then if it needs animation, then I animate it. So pretty much like anything that you see and like think of like a cell phone game, um, I make. Nice, awesome. Oh, cool. Well, so we have a wide variety of experiences and, uh, and interests and so forth here on the forum. And those of you that have joined us as, um, as participants, please chime in, um, you know, join in on the, um, the conversation as we go. And so here's a thought. Um, when, when and I'll just talk from my own perspective, okay? So, so I am a feminist. I'm not a hardcore feminist, but Gloria Steinem is one of my huge um, heroes, I guess you might say. And uh, and I I just think that that women have so much more to bring to the table and and have so much to to give to the world and so when me too started happening i was like well it's about freaking time that's the way i felt about it i thought it's it's time to bring it out from the shadows and and give people a voice and let them uh, say what they need to say and just be out in in front about it without fear of reprisal because i think that from my generation standpoint that was always a a concern was you know trying to balance the risk reward do I say something? Do I not say something? You know, what, uh, what's the cost to me to do it? And so I think that when, when Me Too and Time's Up and all of these started, I think it started giving people permission to, to speak up and, and tell their truth. So that's only my perspective. And then, you know, based on some conversations that I had with other women, I started doing some research about it and I, I, you know, shared some of the articles with you guys that are on the panel too. Um, and was kind of surprised to find out that was maybe not everybody's perspective. So, and that there seemed to be some generational differences about it. So I'm going to just throw that out there and, you know, depending on where you are in this generational mix, you know, because I'm, I'm up there at the baby boomer, you know, I'm, um, I'm at the the top there, you know, and then we've got, you know, down to, to Kristen and Michaela, you know, who I'm assuming are millennials. I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, but what are your thoughts about this? What's your experience been? <laughs> I don't have any personal, like, experience in terms of, like, I've been me too um, in like specifically the workplace, um, I remember when the whole movement started, it was kind of hard for me because my workplace is very male dominated. And I think a lot of um, people just like around that I know that I work like, I've never experienced anything like that. So I get I got a little defensive because um, some women in my industry have experienced stuff like that. And it got like, I felt a little out of hand just because like I want to defend my industry. I never have felt that ever. But in terms of like men versus women and like sexual stuff, I have been like uncomfortable before around a guy who's maybe being too pushy. Okay. What do you mean you, you felt like it was out of control? You mean the number of people raising complaints or? No, I felt like it turned into this thing not maybe not specifically the me too movement but like more so when like feminism be, like started making really like an outbreak like i consider myself a feminist now not so much then um because i didn't understand it and so a lot of like video games will come out with like girls with giant boobs or like you can't play as a girl character and growing up as someone who loves video games and was always into them that was a little irritating to me because as also a creator of video games I would never want to like put a video game out there maybe it is about a boy character and people be like 
well, you're, you hate women because you don't have a playable female character. So stuff like that kind of was irritating. Like, if I'm a creator and I want to draw someone with big boobs, like, that should be my, I should be allowed to do that. But the problem is, almost everyone in the industry is a guy. So when you're a guy drawing a girl with big boobs, you kind of get, like, you kind of get, like, they blame you a lot for that. I felt a little bit harsh. It's like yeah. a man drawing it. It's like, what's wrong with you? You're sexualizing her. But a woman drawing it, it's like, yeah, way to go. Rock it out. Make her look awesome. Yeah, it's okay. like kind of like a... It's kind double of, standard. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm not a fan of double standards, so... Wow. That is a real... That is super, super interesting. Yeah. So I want to put something out there as far as me, too. I want to get, get your opinion before I give... The, the idea of the generation thing, is the Me Too movement is the acknowledgement of sexual harassment or sexual assault, whether in the workplace or not in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So I think with that being said, or that kind of common understanding is that it isn't generational. I just think that the, the younger you are, you're more apt to vocalizing it because yeah. The older you are, you weren't, you were so s trained to take it, not accept it, not that it didn't happen to you. So I think that now that we have support, um, if women are older, they want to actually have a healthier lives, they'll actually seek therapy, so they'll be more vocal. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends on those type of things. If you have a support system, if you're if you're seeking to get to become a better whole person, you'll be more vocal. And the younger you are, the more vocal you'll be about it. Mm -hmm. But I think that's I think it's still there and it happens. It's just that like my mother, she had she had a sex uh, her first sexual encounter when she was four years old, and she's only told me wow. was when I was in fourth grade it happened. Mm -hmm. um, I think. You know, and I don't even think I've told my daughters. Um, I've told maybe a couple of people, but that's it. Wow. You know, I, I thought... Um, Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. 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 Are you there? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here. I'm here. Go ahead. Now, I, I, my hope had been that a lot of groundbreaking work was done, you know, starting in, in the sixties and the seventies and the eighties. And, um, you know, my hope was that by the time my daughter was of an age to start, you know, coming into the workforce and so forth, that a lot of this stuff would be settled and done and fixed. And, and, and if not, at least that we would have somehow empowered them and given them a voice where they could speak up and they could say what they felt, you know. And so in, in reading some of the stuff that's been coming out, it's like if you hear if you hear somebody younger who says, well, I don't even know what you're talking about because I don't ever see that in my workplace. And and I'm sort of like, well, well, then you're welcome. You know, it's, you know it's yeah. it. uh, but, but I'm really more that uh, I think you're just really lucky. Yeah. yeah. I, I yeah. think that yeah. there is still a, a, a that predatory um, behavior is still going to go on as long as it's tolerated, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I think that like, I've always felt like I was raised in a situation where like, if that ever happened to me, I was very much allowed to talk about it and come forward about it. Like, it was never, like, a shameful thing for, like, for, like, not shame on me, shame on them, of course, but, like, I think that speaks to kind of what you're saying, like, generationally wise, like, I don't think older generations were, like, super felt safe to speak about this stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I feel completely safe to speak about this stuff, had it, like, super happened to me. Yeah. I've had it happen to me. I started working when I was 16 and the first five or six jobs I had, I would, I worked with a lot of men, a lot of like young men. I was 15 to, you know, 20 and they were, I was movie theaters. So they were kids too, you know, and so a lot of people don't know boundaries and they would overstep. And I, if I felt uncomfortable, I had no problem speaking up about it. Um, and either asking, you know, I would always, 
but at the same time, I wanted to approach it with caution, being like, hey, I don't know if they even know that they did this, but what they did wasn't okay, and I no longer want to work with them, so you can handle it how you want, but don't give me shifts with them, kind of thing. Um, where do you know that to me probably four where did or five that times. come from? Why did you huh? have that? Why did you have that kind of boldness to say that at, at such a young age? Um, I don't know. I guess uh, I grew up in a house where you kind of um, you were told who you were going to be. You were quiet. You didn't get to have like your own interests and stuff. Not that I was super suppressed or anything. Like I have great parents and all that. But um, then when I got out into you know my own real world I I just kind of stayed quiet and then I don't know I just felt like if I wanted to you know take care I had to take care of myself I wasn't going to go to my parents for it so I wasn't going to bother them with it I wasn't going to you know I wasn't going to talk to anybody about it so I had to take care of it myself in a different way and in going to my bosses I'm I'm not totally sure yeah. <laughs> oh, it's um but that too is so, you know, so for the Me Too movement, I'm like, okay, well, I'm on board. But at the same time, I feel like at this point, it's starting to go sideways where now men are afraid of women. And it's actually hurting a little bit now because it's gone a little overboard where a man can work like his entire life, be a great guy, but there could be, you know, some snotty woman that's like oh well I want that job so I'm gonna say this about him and then regardless if it's true or not his reputation is over and his job is over and I'll get that job and so I and in clients that I have I'm an esthetician so when I get men every once in a while that topic comes up and men are terrified they're like I have to either get behind this or get completely completely trampled by it and I don't even know how to talk to women anymore and so I think that's a problem that's coming up with this too mm -hmm. There's also a lot of men that, like, at least I feel like mine, like, kind of my age that I've come across that are, like, totally cool and, like, not afraid to be, like, yeah, I'm a feminist. And it's, like, really refreshing and cool, I think. Like, I think, like, to what you were saying about how it was younger people who didn't, like, maybe didn't necessarily understand that there are boundaries there. Like, there needs to be, I think, better effort teaching men also, like, these are boundaries <laughs> like you shouldn't outstep these you know yeah well you know it, so I had two sons and and when they were in their teens um, and I, w I was very involved in their in their lives I listened to the music that they listened to and I you know it was really involved you know and there was I remember a song had come out um, by Stone Temple Pilots. And, and so I'm dating myself, right? <laughs> I'm dating my kids. But the song had said, um, you know what's on my mind. I know you know what's on my mind. I know you want what's on my mind. And it was, and basically it was an anthem okaying, you know, you to attack a woman, you know, regardless of what she said. And I sat them both down and I had this conversation. I, you know, I think Joel was like 13 and he's probably thinking, ah, my mom is crazy, you know, but Stephen was 15. And I said, look, this is not okay. You know, mm -hmm. no means no. And boundaries are boundaries. And you don't get to decide what they are just because you're bigger and stronger and blah, 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 and all that, you know, but I don't know how many people have those conversations with right. their kids, you know, and, and mm -hmm. explain that to them, especially at that pivotal time where maybe everything they're learning about sex is coming from TV and from movies and from, music you know and and music especially some of you know some of it can be so misogynistic and and yeah. um, self-serving from a male perspective you know do you think that mothers who have both boys and girls are going to be more aware of teaching their kids versus a mother with just boys um my that's i guess I've seen my sister and she only has boys and she doesn't teach them anything. And they're teenagers. I feel like it's the father's job to teach them too. It's like, well, that wasn't going to work in my system. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, not I've right. Like not every system is going to have the same situation. Like, um, I feel like like kind of what 
um, Monique was saying, like, I think a father, especially that has daughters and a son is going to be better at right. teaching their sons how to treat women. Mm -hmm. But I think that sometimes like older generations of men are kind of like, oh, 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 like get that woman. Like <laughs> that's not super great either. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you're true. And, and, and actually I have seen where families uh, circle yeah. around the boys and begin to, I mean, and I realize this is an extreme example, but you know, Brock, what's his name that, you know, raped the girl behind the dumpster at, at um, yeah. Stanford, you know, come on. I mean, they circled the wagons around that guy and right. um, that was just, that was wrong. But yeah. <sighs> Susie, are you here? I think she's muted. muted. <laughs> Let me unmute you if I can. Unmute me. There you go. <laughs> Keep her muted. I, Just kidding. I know. I know. Michaela likes that. <laughs> I um I was having terrible technical difficulties. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. But I just I'm on my phone now. So. Wow. Sunspots at your house or something. <laughs> I was moving around as you could see, but I um I couldn't get it to work on my surface, so I'm on my phone. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Well, you look lovely now and sound lovely. So. But um, what, you know, I, what I'm I, sorry, I missed the first part of every. Well, we've, we've had some really good chats so far. So um, I, I was going to add something. Um, I think that the me too, now that we've, it's been what, about a year or so, a year and a half, yeah. maybe um, that now that we are, women as to it has brought us together in the sense of okay this is the problem and then the, now the men are scared how to behave so now we have to go like okay let's start we're gonna it's gonna take a while mm -hmm. but it's gonna be about communication and respect and teaching and then i think it's going to get better from the younger younger on the way up as opposed yeah. to the older going down um yeah because it's just going to take baby steps but it's it's just even just a consciousness and a um i think that the the both sides have it bad because the men have no idea how to behave and i think also i've noticed that the older the man the harder it is for them to okay like i know this exists but i don't even know how to talk to women anymore they don't because know how that's to recalibrate. all recalibrate yeah yeah they have to recalibrate and it's and it's easier like uh you know a, tw a 20 year old 30 year old well, my daughter's 30, um, that age group is like, they're aware. And the, the guys are kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm ahead. I'm defending all the women in the office or whatnot. It's the 40 and 50 year olds that, yeah. and 60 year olds that don't know how to behave anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know, I mean, I, I'm up in the Bay area, you know, yeah. and, and it is bad behavior among young men is rampant up here. Yeah. And, you know, there's, you know, from the, the Uber scandals, you know, um, all the way to uh, a lot of the tech things that, you know, they're, they're able to start a business, make a lot of money. Uh, we're all young. We're all, you know, around the same age. We're all having fun. And they have, they've never had a mom apparently teach them, you know, the way some of us did, or they've never had anybody tell them, this is not okay. You know, so, you know, there was, there was one company up here, I'm, I'm not going to say the name of it, but there was one company up here in the San Francisco Bay Area. These were young people. These were men under 30 who started this company. Everybody working there was under 30 and they literally had like orgy type things. And it was like the guys against the girls. This was what was expected of the women if they were going to be part of this boys club or part of the group or look like they were, you know, um, they were all on board with this. And it was, it, you know, I, I, the company got shut down. There was, there was, you know, all it takes is one lawsuit, you know, from somebody and that's, that's a bad deal and got the CEO out, brought in a board, blah, 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 and saved the company. But the point that in this day and age with, with, raising our kids, you know, into, with all of the exposure that they should have had to everything that's gone on, um, 
that 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 went on that that was brand new that was a brand new company i feel like young people with fast money make bad decisions <laughs> yeah that's a good point that yeah. should be a bumper sticker All right yes, <laughs> yes. I, yes. <laughs> when you don't have like that kind of like gradient of time to get used to like an influx of money and like also just like a mentality of like a mature person yeah. like you just think you can get away with whatever you want and like a lot of these older men being taken down by me too like also have a lot of money and that's kind of how they got there mm -hmm. but yeah it's a bummer yeah. i wonder if there's a, rela a correlation or a study of men and their behavior depending on um how fast they got their they have they got their power that, and wealth yeah. That's interesting. The the power and wealth, and power and money, yeah. And thinking well, and power adult. is a really good keyword because, of course, then you can look at you know more low income areas where that's going on a lot too. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, power is I think the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. I almost think that's, that's like the alert to people who are like sexual predators it's like not even about a sexual experience it's about having power over somebody that's kind of icky yeah well so that's why we have to get more women everywhere in all different levels of of of, of working yeah well, i think people have unfortunately a fascination with things like that too like i don't know i am really weird about what i watch on tv and everything and i'm kind of a kid that way and kind of really shelter myself from stuff um, and Mad Men is a was a really, really popular TV show. So mm -hmm. my husband and I started watching that. I couldn't get past like the first episode. I was like, I can't, I can't watch this. I realize it used to happen, but I can't even, I can't even handle watching it. Like it makes me so mad that yeah. that's what it was expected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, but of course that show glorified it quite a bit. I mean, I never watched more than the first episode, but <laughs> well, <laughs> you know? it was what, like six seasons or something or more? Or yeah, long? it was oh, on for a really long time. It was a huge fascination with that. And, and I don't know if it was, I mean, it would be interesting to know why did people like that show so much? Was it nostalgic? Was it, it was very good. I thought it was, character. I thought it, I thought it was interesting. Um, it totally weirded me out also like the first like the whole show like just how women are treated in that show but like mm -hmm. I kind of found it fascinating in like a educational standpoint like wow like I do like I do feel lucky that I live in this time where like I never have been treated like that and like geez it's it was really eye-opening for me mm -hmm. yeah um, and I think also having those things on TV, there's probably, you know, some young men out there that are like, yeah. wow, how glamorous. I want to be like those guys. So, I mean, you know, I don't know. Being historical is good, but glamorizing it is not. Yeah. I'm not sure. There's so much gray area that it gets to be like a, a really tough conversation of you know, well, in this situation, that was okay, but in that situation, it wasn't kind of thing. I don't know. And even, like, so I work at a spa, and everybody that works there, we're just naturally really, really touchy-feely people. That's just who we are. That's why we got into this industry. And almost always, we have a man massage therapist. And um, it's been interesting watching them coming in and out, because as far as women goes, there's, like, I think there's, like, 48 women, and then there's one man. And that man, he either jumps right in and is part of us, or he really sticks to himself, doesn't last very long. So it, and it's just interesting because I'll be typing at the computer and all of a sudden someone's massaging my shoulders and I'm like, yeah, that I don't even look at who it is. I don't care. Keep doing it. It feels awesome. So I trust everybody there. But if I turned around and it was the one man, even though I have the same relationship with him as other women, it would be so inappropriate. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's funny because uh, it, I don't know if any of you are Survivor fans, but I'm yeah. <laughs> a huge Survivor fan. Never missed it. 
and this um, this particular season, there was this gentleman on the show that was a very touchy feely, and he and he was very inappropriate, and you know the you know to the point of rubbing women and and trying to lay with them when they were sleeping at night, and and so several women complained about it. And one of the older women took it on herself to be sort of like a champion for them and confronted him. And then they backed away because of course they're all, it's gameplay and you know, they're, you know, trying to be strategic and all of that. But he kept excusing it. Like, that's just the way I am. You know, I kiss my boys and I, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very, you know, touchy and, and before long, of course it's all edited. You're only seeing what they want you to see, but, it was like before long, this guy had been wrongly, you know, accused. He had been, it had been misinterpreted what it was. And, you know, all of a sudden it was the girls were, were overreacting and all of this other stuff. The guy never changed. He was still wildly inappropriate. And mm -hmm. just the other night, the episode the other night, um, if I'm going to give it away for anybody who hasn't seen it. But he gets taken out of the game at the end and you don't see what happened. It's just, you know, the host shows up and he tells everybody that he's left the game because he got inappropriate with somebody who wasn't even in the game. So it must've been somebody on the casting the producer. Crew. Yeah. And, and it was <laughs> like, you know, I, my husband and I were watching this together and we're texting. I said, he, the dude just can't keep his hands to himself. So it was going to come out. And, you know, yeah. It's really frustrating how like, People will sit there, like the whole victim blaming thing, like that's really frustrating me because it's like, I don't care if you think I'm overreacting. If I'm uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable. Like, mm -hmm. yes, maybe he's not being a huge jerk, but he's making me uncomfortable and he should change the way he approaches me. Yeah. So that's, yeah, it's really frustrating. Yeah. And, and then that brings up the question of, you know, if somebody, I mean, because also, I, I'm just thinking of my industry. There are women that come in every now and then in my industry that are not touchy-feely. I don't know why they're in my industry, but they don't want that kind of stuff. And so that could even be seen as sexual harassment. You don't know what anyone's orientation is, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, But it's super, as far as how I see it, it's all really innocent at my work. Um, but we've even had to have a conversation about this somebody brought it up like I don't like that everybody comes up and hugs me I don't want anyone to touch me it's not okay and everybody does it everybody does it because mm -hmm. that's how we all are and so we just assume everyone's like that so then it brings up the question of like what is okay and how many times is okay and if like I don't know let's say you meet a man for the first time at your job and he is a huggy touchy feely person and so he leans in for hug you immediately are like whoa dude not cool do you let that go do you report it what do you do how many times do you let that be okay mm -hmm. kind of thing like do you just go okay i'm gonna let plead the fifth let that be okay but i'm just gonna let him know you know what really cool to meet you i'd prefer if you didn't hug me and then hopefully he respects that and then you let it go. Or do you go, hey, that wasn't okay. I'm going to go straight to the boss and I'm going to report that guy. Like I that. Feel like, I feel like that question too. Like, yeah. When do you speak up kind of thing? I think that anytime you're uncomfortable, you should say it, it just as you want to be treated. Don't do it. I don't like it. And then what, just like a regular conversation, because I think um, we shouldn't, go from zero to a hundred mm -hmm. like that i think mm -hmm. that once you say something the person's aware of what your level is and then and then you re then you're like dude you know this is like really not cool right. you know and and then get a little and then you know but you should always give the person a chance it's just like anybody there's women that come and t hug me i've never met them i'm like yeah, I don't know you. I, I have to build that rapport with you. And then maybe I'll let you know. Mm -hmm. I've learned to be uh, in the it's situation by situation, right? Mm -hmm. right? So it's it's sometimes, you know, someone's creeping you out and they're in your personal space. If they come, like if, if someone's going to come in to hug me and I'm not about it, it's like, oh, I'm not a hugger. Here's my hand. 
-hmm. you know, you could do that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Or, or if it's someone you're so comfortable with and you're having a moment and a connection to, and it's innocent, for sure. I'm a touchy huggy person too. And, and frankly, I mean, I, you know, the, the Me Too movement is kind of bummed me out because it's taken away that uh, freedom for mm -hmm. women and men to have those wonderful connections and situations where, yeah, a gesture of a hug is a, totally appropriate. Yeah. I just think, I think it's just a matter of communicating. That's all. Yeah, I, I think so too. And, and, and I liked what, what Michaela had said about, I'm not comfortable. And, and if I don't feel comfortable, I should be able to say, I don't feel comfortable. I think if we could all just be there and, yeah. and not having to necessarily make it right from the get go. And I'm not saying that any of these women that raised the issue overreacted. I don't think no. so, that they did. I think it was after years of, of neglecting it, you know, that they did something, but, um, the first time it happens, then just, dude, not okay. You know, back, I, I'm really happy to meet you or, um, or like you said, Susie, I'm not a hugger, you know, it's just, you know, but I'm really super glad to meet you and, and that kind of thing. And then if it were to persist, you know, then that's a time to start, yeah. you know, some sort of an escalation process. I think like, yeah. people really need to be given the chance to like, learn and understand what it is that is being wrong like a lot of these movements I feel like there's like this dog pile um, mentality where if someone says the wrong thing one time everyone like online or twitter instagram whatever like dog piles like you're the worst you're person so yeah so like yeah. there need there needs to be like people need to be given a chance to learn why what they did like they need to be shown the perspective of why it was wrong instead of just like you're wrong, you're going to jail type of thing. Yeah. Or and then there are people who know that they're wrong and will keep right. doing the thing. And those are the people that should go to jail. Yeah. <laughs> and there are of course certain acts done even once that are unacceptable. Yeah. So there's that too. Of course it's not, you know, right. give everybody that opportunity. You know, right. uh, Steph that was with us before she had to drop because her, she couldn't maintain a connection. And so she finally dropped, but she sent a, a a question or a comment um, that she was wondering um, if there's a backlash from older women toward the more vocal Me Too women. And she's heard some people tell her that, you know, they thought it went too, too far and too much. And, you know, and I think that's an interesting, it's a sad, it makes me sad to think yeah. that maybe somebody who's older would say, hey, I, I had this too, or I put up with it, you know, and you just need to learn how to deal with it. I, you know, that's, you know, I, that's not okay. And I'm not trying to put words in her mouth as to that's what she's talking about. But, but if older women are being um, irritated by younger people speaking up, you know, wh where does that yeah. come from? Does it come from because it happened to them and they, they just dealt with it or they lived with it or like a weird jealousy almost like, that's coming out in like the wrong way almost like yeah. I yeah. like I kind of wish that like I had the support to like deal with this and I didn't so now like I begrudgingly I'm kind of jealous that you do maybe yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, have a, I have a client who every time I see her I end up reminding her at some point in our conversation that I am a millennial because she she brings up all kinds of sensitive topics and then she always throws it all in millennials face like goes oh that me too movement oh it's all just these millennials that just want attention and i'm like okay <laughs> i'm a millennial and i don't want attention <laughs> but i don't want to be sexually harassed the millennial that first raised their hand yeah a lot of <laughs> these people that are doing it are older women so that's yeah they're older women and it happened yeah. to when they were younger women and they're just now finding their voice yep. to say something about it, it yeah. they're, they're women that are my age and older that are now coming out because well, I, they feel empowered to do so. Exactly. And I, I think when you have a predator, um, I, I think Monique, you were the first person that said that sexual predator. And that's exactly what it is. When you have somebody like a Harvey Weinstein, you know, that needs to be called out. And, mm -hmm. and once, you know, one woman said something and then somebody else said something and, um, then something needs to be done, you know, about it. it it's, uh, regardless of the age, you know, but he had, 
he has women all up and down the spectrum, you know, that were saying mm -hmm. that he, he preyed on them. Right. Well, and yeah, he was like in a position of power for so long and so used to doing it and so used to getting away with it that like even like the, maybe the first people that spoke out were older because it happened to them when they were younger, but I'm sure he had not stopped since then. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But then you have uh, people like uh, an acquaintance of mine who who lost his job because he complimented a work made a woman that her scarf was pretty and she ran she went and ran and, and maybe there's more to it but uh, the source that i got it from was like it was such an innocent gesture and he lost his job over that like there's this thing too where it's just this extreme where it's uh, being abused in that way that's mm -hmm. terrible yeah but i you know i think a company that would overreact to that point i mean if that was truly what the situation was that that's that's yeah super risk averse company you know yeah a really re it was really ridiculous i mean it was a really sad situation but and i think that's that, the, men are afraid of they're afraid of complimenting yeah. they're afraid of saying anything yeah i actually got into a little internet site with someone i went to high school with at one point because she angrily posted online walking my dog today and a man rolled down his window and said in case no one's told you i think you're beautiful have a great day and drove off and she was furious how dare you think i don't think i'm beautiful how dare you think i need a man to validate me and it's like whoa that was very clearly oh, not his nice. intention <laughs> <laughs> that was really i mean you know i i i have so many times tried to and not necessarily with a I don't think I've ever done it to a man, but I've done it to women where you, you know, you pass them on the street and you go, your hair looks amazing. Yeah. Just, just yeah. Nice I love when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> My mom does it all the time. She does it to men too. She'll stop a man and she's very touchy feely and she's very bubbly <laughs> and she'll, she'll grab a man's arm and go, oh my gosh, that jacket. Oh, that fabric. Oh, you just look fabulous. And the, all right, you need to have a talk with your mom. It's so <laughs> overwhelming. <laughs> you need to have a talk with her. <laughs> but I, had, I had someone tell me, and it was a gentleman recently, and he, I was just walking through somewhere, and he said, excuse me, whatever you're doing is working. Keep doing it. And then he just walked away, and I was yeah. like, oh, <laughs> okay. Like, yeah, I'll take it. I'll take yeah. that. It wasn't like a cat call. It was a genuine no. compliment. Oh, yes. I think people <laughs> exactly. no longer That's know how to take difference. a compliment. That's the difference. So like your friend that was so annoyed or, or offended, you know, if he had rolled down his whistle and cat call or rolled down his window and cat called her or whistled or whatever. Yeah. I, I would be like, okay, whatever, you know, yeah, like, for something. sure. That happened to my, that happened to my friend like the other day. She just told me not a cat call, but a, she was at a bar and a guy came up to her and did the whole like, oh, why aren't you smiling thing? Like, uh -huh. <laughs> this is so icky. But like, I re like, cause my reaction when she told me was like, ew, like that's gross. Like that's so misogynistic, blah, blah, blah. But my friend was like, yeah, well she handled it so much better. She talked to him about it and was like, did you say that to this guy? Did you say that to this guy? Is that who you like approach them? Why can't you just say hi? Like that's, it comes off really slimy when you say stuff like that. And like, yeah, I really love that approach of like educating someone when they do say something because it wasn't malicious or anything. I think he's just like, I'm a guy and I've heard other guys say things like this to women, but it's like, <laughs> we don't like that very much. Yeah. <laughs> I got my education, yeah. you know, listening to my big <laughs> The smiling brother. one is a hard one. That's, I don't like, I get, I get told that all the time because I've been told I have like resting, you know. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so I've been told that yeah. thousands of times by men of all ages and it always, it does not make me smile. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, when, when I was, um, when I was first single uh, after, you know, after my divorce, and, you know, and I'm working at a company where I, I desperately need this job and I didn't like the job. I was trying to find another job when my marriage fell apart and, and I didn't like the job, but I was stuck. I mean, I was the sole support for three kids and now I've got to, you know, I've got to stay in there and hang in the game and do what I can and make as much money as I can to support these three little monkeys. And then hopefully something good is going to come out of all of this, you know? 
but there was a, a man in our organization. He was, he was quite senior to me and he had quite the reputation of, you know, chasing women and, and not being true to his wife and all that stuff. And so he called me into his office one afternoon, you know, and shut the door. And so I'm in his office with the door shut. And he said, you know, I, I just heard that your marriage broke up, you know, I'm very sorry. And, and then began, he never touched me. He never propositioned me. He never did it, but, but we're in his office, the door is shut and he begins to explain to me why I shouldn't take it personally that my husband left me for another woman because men are just not made to be, um, monogamous and they're they're just wow you know, they're, that was super wow. his place to say any of that exactly yeah and so so he's telling me all of this now he's he has power over me he could fire me he could promote me he could do anything to me and i'm sitting there thinking i you know i i need this job but my pride was was so offended i was so you know upset and, and so when he makes this comment that that men are just not made to be monogamous and I said, well, then that really just kind of puts you on the same level as animals, right? And he goes, well, yeah, absolutely. He totally agreed with me. <laughs> and then he's, you know, he finally ends up the kind of, if I can do anything for you, if you need anything, you know, and, and as I'm leaving his office, his hand is on my lower back, you know, and stuff. Yeah. That was the only time he touched me. So I, I had um, a, a very close friend. I, I considered him my mentor at that company. And I went to him after work that night and I told him, I said, you're not going to believe what happened, you know, and I'm telling him about it. And he said, you need to go to HR. And I said, no, I don't because I need this job. I just need to not ever be alone with that guy again. I need to make sure I'm not ever in a position where he can do that to me again. And he's like, well, okay. You know, I understand. But it was like, to feel, you know, the whole thing about power is a big deal because I felt powerless and yet still had to be true to myself you know like um i'm sure he was i'm sure he was dangling something out there for me mm. you know but he was fishing he was fishing yes <laughs> he's so needy look at her she's desperate <laughs> her slime ball husband left her <laughs> <laughs> she wants a slime ball boss now <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> replace one with another <laughs> some women bite at that stuff though when they're vulnerable like that right. i mean and that's why it happens yeah and and to the point of you know i was in pretty desperate straits you know i was at the point of of having to trade off do i work overtime because i need extra money but my kids are at home alone at this point you know so it, it it's a it's you know it's very easy to see how how men or women could prey on somebody in a, in a subservient position like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the, the Me Too movement that's being overlooked a little bit too, is that it's become a feminist thing because it started off with women. But mm -hmm. I think that, that it's being brushed over that obviously that can happen to men too. But then there's that double standard there of like, well, I don't know if a man were to speak out he would probably be seen almost as a joke. Like, what are you kidding? Like you let a woman take advantage of you? It's a joke. That's something I'm kind of really passionate about right now is how like men in our society aren't really allowed to like show emotions and sh like they aren't shown or taught that they're allowed to feel that way. Like you're allowed to feel like you have been like harassed by a woman and like you're yeah. allowed to speak out about it and not feel shame by like, machismo other people like that yeah that frustrates me a lot yeah and um oh I was gonna say something else on that um do you think it happens more and they just don't talk about it or I think so I mean I, I mean I definitely think so I mean I I think of my mom who's of course meaning to be very innocent but she probably makes men uncomfortable all the time. I tell them they have the most <laughs> gorgeous eyes or the most luscious hair. I mean, the words she uses, I'm like, 
mom, you can't say that to people. <laughs> and it's so innocent and she truly believes it to be true and she's genuinely trying to compliment them. But I'm sure that kind of thing happens all the time or, um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure it happens a lot and men just don't speak out because they would be, that it would be a joke. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of guy friends and like, not necessarily specifically like, oh, feeling like they've been like taken advantage of by a woman, but like they, a lot of them, when I have like talked about this kind of thing with them, have all admitted like they feel like they aren't allowed to talk about their feelings and like they've just been kind of raised to like, don't cry, shut up, like, the only thing you can feel is, like, yeah. anger and strength, and, yeah, be a man, like, that is, a lot of them feel choked up, and then I also heard a statistic that a lot of men, like, my age are, like, committing suicide, because they don't know where to put these emotions, because they don't know how to speak about them, because they're told growing up that they're not allowed to, or made to feel like they're not allowed to. Isn't yeah. that fascinating? You know, when you think about um, the way that we have raised our kids with, um, I don't know, you know, it, that they can do anything and they can be anything. And, and how did we miss the memo that our boys needed to learn how to speak up for themselves and to be open and, and be uh, emotional and so forth. But you know, that what is it, the target group for male suicide is is something like 24 to 44 or something is the that's the highest statistic and you've got veterans and all kinds of things in there but mm -hmm. you know like where did they not you know it's surprising to me Michaela that you're talking about men that you work with young men that you work with who are saying this because oh yeah you know that that's my generation kind of thought you know um it's also like cultural, like depending on what culture you come out of, I think of, um, and it's not all of them, but I think it's sad and I think it's changing and I think it's just something that's important that needs to be talked about because a lot of the things that are being talked about right now and like our culture are very like women focused and I think that is something important that needs to be brought to the attention and to the conversation is that like men also have these like feelings and emotions and like should be allowed to be what's it called vulnerable mm -hmm. without feeling like ashamed. Right. And I think too that young women need to learn what actually the feminist movement is about because I had a client yeah. who was telling me a story about at college how she you know is part of the feminist movement and women are so much better than men and I'm like whoa 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 that's not the feminist movement feminists we are trying to be equal we want equal pay we want equal respect equal authority it's equal which mm -hmm. means that you also still have to respect them yeah it's not we are better it's that we want to be equal and I think that's something that's really missing Mark she was like whoa I've never heard that I'm like okay well <laughs> Now that's, you have, so go spread that around your school, please. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And um, I think, yeah, culturally, like my husband is Hispanic, and yeah, he might kill me for saying this, but the first time I ever met his dad, I overheard him saying to my husband, this was 13 years ago, so, you know, he didn't follow his dad's advice, but I heard him saying, oh, well, she's too good for you, so, uh, you know, do what you want with her and then get rid of her. There's no way she'll ever last, and that is definitely a cultural thing where he is just, you know, be a man, do what you need, get rid of her, don't waste your time. Um, yeah, the, um, the guy I talk about this the most is, like, comes from a Hispanic background also like yeah but very much you see Mo like it yeah 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 he's still it's still like one of our biggest problems is communicating he's like well I just don't talk to you about anything I'm like well you know that's not a good relationship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but he has no idea he has no idea how to how to do that and I think that's a partial thing but also definitely from what you're saying just a man thing he's really the only man in, in my life so I don't know but <laughs> except Ray. I, 
Um, the women's, the, with the Me Too movement, it all kind of, feminine, feminist movement kind of all got lumped into Me Too. So whether it was you were, had suffered some kind of harassment or you were, you know, a woman wanting equal pay, it kind of got all lumped into that whole thing. Um, so when the, the march came about, I've, ne I didn't suffer from harassment. I didn't have any issues or anything, but I marched because I had, um, my own reasons why I wanted to go in March. I wanted to march with my daughter, Amanda mm -hmm. and her friends. And we all had our own personal reasons of why we wanted to stand up for women's rights. I guess it is, mm -hmm. is you could lump it all into one thing. Um, for me, it was women around the world who are not who in, in other countries who have to cover themselves up i mean and those kinds of things um and and i think it can it's just a personal like how do you look at feminism what does it mean to you and it and it's kind of all lumped up into that one me too movement i think well, I, when i oh sorry go ahead. no go ahead i was just gonna say like when i started like actually understanding and getting like um more interested in the feminist movement is like when i started talking to my friends who are like part of the lgbtq community and like how the feminist movement isn't really necessarily all about women it's about like humans and like so i call myself a humanist because like yeah like everyone deserves the same respect and pay and opportunities and mm -hmm. respect like everybody you know it should be equal across the board and it's disappointing and kind of unfortunate that like kind of i mean maybe still it's being misunderstood as only a female issue because it's called like feminism when right really like it's bigger than that mm -hmm. And within the Me Too movement, you know, there were there were other marginalized groups that joined that movement because they could identify with it and they could say, yeah, Me Too, I was exploited, I was sexually, you know, exploited um, by somebody in a position of power. And, and that's really the way it ought to be is um, it shouldn't all be lumped in together, you know, because um, it, it has, issues. it all goes down to, it all goes back to respect, you know, and, and Susie, I agree with you. I've, I've marched in every women's march since, since it started. Um, and my reasons have to do with, with equity, you know, wage equity, um, opportunity equity, you know, that's, that's what I think we need to be raising a banner for other people have different reasons, you know, and when you go to the march, you see what all those different reasons <laughs> are you know, and, and what their thing is. But it all boils down to respect. Nobody should be able to have power over another person that um, that puts them down, marginalizes them, sidelines them, takes something away from them. That's, to me, that's the bottom line. And I do think that the feminist movement paved the way for a lot of that. So did the civil rights movement. You know, every everything that's been every change that's ever been made that had any impact at all was a big change. It's a big mm -hmm. thing, you know? So, you know, this, that's why me too. Yeah. It's big and it's messy and it's sloppy and it's had spillover into areas that we probably didn't want. And so did every, every movement, you know, but if that's what it takes to bring attention to inequity, then that's, that's what it takes. Well, ladies, we are at the end of our time. So who's got burning last statements to make about, about this heavy duty topic in the ladies room? I feel like yours was the really good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really enjoyed having you guys on here and having the different generations represented and the, the different viewpoints and, and what everybody, you know, what everybody brings to the table is different. And that's, that's what's so cool about this. So again, I want to thank my special guests that were with us here today and brought so much great thought leadership here. So just keep watching for our other online forums that are coming. We've got all kinds of good stuff coming down the pike and share it with your friends. This recording will be up on, um, on our website probably within the week. 
So make sure that you go out there and start sharing it with people, let people know what they missed. And a lot of people listen to these in the replay. So make sure that they've got that opportunity and, and that you let them know it's out there. So thanks you guys. Have a wonderful evening and or rest of your evening. And I will see you all soon in the ladies room. Thank you, Patty. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you, Kayla. <laughs> Welcome, Mom. <laughs>